Uh, good morning. Lots of fresh faces out here. More people than I expected. Um, but yeah, so today I'm here to talk about some simple frameworks that can really help in live ops, uh, not just identifying your issues, because uh, KPIs really help do that, but uh, to break down what the fundamental problem is within your game. So quick introduction, uh, I'm Patrick McGrath lead of June's Journey, which is a hidden object game that I'll be using as an example. Uh, and so I'll explain a little about that because you don't look like the uh, typical demographic because it's 50 plus year old women that uh, are playing this game. Uh, and from Wooga. So yeah, uh, June's Journey, player life cycles, compulsion loops, and then putting those together so you can really uh, leverage uh, these two frameworks within live ops. And here's June's journey. This is uh, the splash screen when you enter the game. Uh, it's a hidden object game, which means we serve you uh, screens and you find objects on there. We're on all the major platforms on mobile. You can also find us uh, via Facebook on the browser. So have a lot of our bases covered. Uh, something's going on with this screen over here. Ah, I see. Thank you. Um, it is a story-driven game, uh, so there's lots of drama and mystery as you follow June, our protagonist, as she solves <laughs> murders and crimes and just random things that are happening to her and her friends. Um, and a typical scene would look like this, where it has roughly 72 items, we have a list at the bottom here, so you have to find the snake, a hippo. As you find these, we're adding more uh, items for you to find. And to complete the core loop, we have a island building portion. So this is where you earn your rewards with the gameplay, come back to the island, you have these buildings. The buildings give you a resource that help you progress and unlock more content. So that's June's journey in about a minute. So you guys are real uh, seasoned vets now. Um, we can move forward with our first framework, which is uh, player life cycles. And the way I like to approach this is using the hierarchy of competence. And so it goes from unconscious competence, where you don't even know that you don't know, all the way to unconscious competence, where you're so good you don't even have to think about it. And one easy example uh, that I use to explain this is driving, which is much more uh, applicable to US rather than Europe. Uh, but uh, imagine the first time you started learning how to drive. Y you weren't uh, thinking about, oh man, uh, brake, gas, the angle I'm turning at. Uh, oh, I forgot about the blinker. You, you just don't even know what you don't know. And so you start to learn uh, these motions you start to identify, oh, I forgot to use my blinker. And then you finally get to, I'm pretty good, I can parallel park and I know I'm pretty dang good. And then you get to the point where on your daily commute, you start driving home and you get into a deep thought and then you come to, as you're pulling up into your street, uh, and you think, holy crap, how did I get here? It's a bit scary, but this is because you've mastered not just driving, but uh, your route home. And so I like to break down player life cycles in this similar way because we're trying to create behaviors where a player logs onto their phone and unconsciously they're going into the app, start collecting their items. And so here's uh, how I like to lay it out. Tap that. Uh, you know, to download June's Journey, the player comes into a first-time user experience. They then transition into the early game once they have the fundamental learnings down and we start to open up more and more features. They start to master these features and then ultimately they're so good at these they don't even have to think about it. And one of the, the things about this is that it's not representational of progression. Uh, so June's journey, first time user experience, is actually a couple days, because remember the demographic is not identifying themselves as gamers, <laughs> right, like 50 plus uh, year old women. Uh, so we have to kind of uh, really breadcrumb and, and handhold. 
But there are some games uh, like AFK Heroes or many of the Supercell games where your first session, maybe second session, and then you're off running. Uh, same thing with early game, mid game, and late game. Hopefully you have late game not that far out, but uh, there's, there's user behaviors that you can look at via you know, uh, analytics to figure out which one of these uh, stages fits your game or product. And so, now that you know a little more about uh, how we approach player life cycles, we'll jump into compulsion loops. And uh, depending on who you are, you might look at compulsion as not a positive word. But, uh, I mean, really, it's just a, it's the urge to behave in a certain way. We all have compulsions. Uh, sorry, it's science. Uh, we're all wired in a similar way, and for games, is what we want to do is have these compulsion loops work within themselves to initiate the reward, reward system. Uh, this is, we're not going to talk about neuroscience and psychology, and, but essentially, you want to have the player feel good within each one of these loops, and have each one of these loops work within themselves and further the next loop. Uh, Zynga actually has a, a word for introducing a new loop that's outside of this. They call them tumors. So you have your core loop, and then if you had another loop outside of that, you're creating something that is not good for the game. Um, so what we'll do is lay out these compulsion loops, because it's very hard to use them when they're stacked up on top of each other, and then just list out what each are. So you go from second to second, minute to minute, uh, all the way to long term. And is what we would do is, well, we'll get to that. I'll first explain what second to second uh, in June's journey is. Uh, it's a hidden object game, so here you have this real-time feedback as you're finding objects. Uh, you can see the numbers are getting bigger, your bonus is rising, you have this urgency from your bonus bar decaying, so you're trying to find these items as quickly as possible. Now, it's not as flashy as Candy Crush or Peggle, where it's like all the chains and breakers, and, but this is for a reason. Uh, this is a skill-based game. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the concentration it takes to get through this uh, is, is far more than a turn-based uh, puzzle game. So it's trying to give that feedback without interrupting that concentration. So that's uh, minute to minute. Uh, is when you finish that single game in the reward loop, all the numbers are coming, the progression's there, the rewards are coming down, it's uh, exciting and it should feel really good to the player every time they see this. You, you don't want to spend too much time, but you don't want to go through it too quickly. And so, moving on to session, simply this is just the core loop, right? You play the game, you get your rewards, for June's Journey you go back, you build on your island, and you get flowers, which is the resource that uh, helps you progress through gameplay. And then I just lump in daily, weekly, long term, not because, well, it, as you can see here, there's a lot of features that we've added that fall into multiple buckets. So it's best to just kind of explain that each one of these should work with your core loop and the incremental progression based off of that because no matter what, like the foundation of your game should be fun, and players uh, engaging with that for a different goal is something that we really believe in uh, at Wooga. And so, time to uh, take a look at what we call the core four. These are the, the four that we really use uh, because the second to second and minute to minute for most products should tie in to your session or core loop. Um, let's put these two together. What we're, we're here here, the, the meat and potatoes aspect of this talk. So we have a player life cycle, uh, and, and we'll just use uh, the engagement aspect for this because normally you can break this down between monetization and engagement. Uh, We'll look at early games specifically, and then we'll add in the compulsion loops. And so what that looks like is you get an Excel sheet, and then you have your session daily, weekly, and long term, and then you start to list out 
what features in your game touch on this. And so I didn't want to put any specific names because, well, we, we have a very uh, themed feature set. So for, for now, this was, uh, we can just consider this the initial feature set. Uh, so how does this work when in live ops, when you're getting all this data and all these KPIs to indicate whether uh, certain parts of your game are healthy? Well, we have a good example here uh, in June's journey where we look at average sessions and then average gameplays. And this comes out to roughly six gameplays per session, which for some games, that's great. Some games, not so great. For June's journey, it's red for a reason. It's not so great because we give away 12 gameplays uh, per session unpaid. So there was some funny user behavior going on here. And because we don't have a ton of time, I don't want to get into how different features were working with each other, but we could identify that players were not maximizing their sessions. So we go back to this uh, core four with the initial feature set. Uh, it's not hard to do math here. Uh, we're, we're pretty slim in a couple areas. And this was what we uh, first identified as our live ops needs. From here, we were able to uh, look at, at, at a couple aspects, but really we wanted to prioritize, because remember we're in the early game, so long term isn't so important. So deprioritize that, look at session daily and weekly, and then we go to our backlog. Please everyone have a feature backlog, let anyone put features in this, uh, but this should be a place where you can go through a cost benefit exercise and have features that you can just immediately pull into uh, any of your live ops needs. So here we identified three really good features that we could implement. We decided to go with challenges because, well, it was the easiest to implement and also it touched on really the, the core three session daily and weekly loops that we wanted to touch on. And so to give you a little explanation of what challenges is for us, well, it's a task-based system that reinforces core loop mechanics. We give an easy, medium, and hard uh, task to a player. They complete these just by doing the regular gameplay. And what we wanted to do here, as I said, was easy, medium, hard. One that you can complete in a session. No problem, no brainer. You don't even have to look at this thing. If you had never seen this and you just played one session, you'd come back to your island and there would be this thing kind of pulsating, saying, hey, tap me. You'd go into this, oh, hey, I'm collecting rewards. Next is the one that you would complete uh, daily, then every two to three days. And to finish that off, as you complete these tasks, uh, you have points that are going towards this long-term reward that is the weekly. And so what did this do for us? Well, uh, rounds played went up. Not only did uh, the rewards uh, uh, get people to play more often, but the actual loop of what we call the uh, help wanted ads in the classified really reinforced that playing the scenes was beneficial uh, to progress quicker. Not only did it help with engagement, but one of the things that we were aiming for was day seven retention, which went up by 1.3 basis points. So if you're looking at like a 20% day seven retention, upping that to 21.3 is actually a massive move. Retention is just not the, the sexy percentages that you wanna look at. Like it's such little incremental jumps, but I mean, they're massive when you look at a game that will be live for the next five years. And a real bonus that we added in here uh, to kind of touch on monetization was <clears throat> we were really missing out on a repeatable uh, ad watch placement. And so we didn't wanna charge hard currency to refresh the tasks here. So we implemented the ad watch and tied that in. And this is where I think the, the real strength of challenges is at because we saw a massive increase with the repeatability of ads. Uh, so always when you're like tying in and integrating all these uh, compulsion loops, think about how monetization can tie in with engagement. 
And uh, yeah, in case you missed it, that's what I'm talking about right there, the, the purple button. But to kind of wrap things up, uh, the takeaways that you should have here are we have player lifecycle and compulsion loops coming together. This is just a, a very simple framework that helps identify the, the true issues because KPIs will tell you like a very high level tertiary, hey, you have pretty low engagement, won't tell you why. Um, but as I said, you need them. And also please have a feature backlog. I've talked to a couple uh, product leads and companies that don't have this. It should be accessible to everybody. There's too many good ideas at your studios and companies. Please leverage that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. If you have any questions, please uh, ask them now. Thank you very much. Whew. Quick question for me before we ask the audience. Um, when you talk about your backlog, yep. is that public facing or is that internal? Internal. Yeah, yes. The reason I ask yes. is um, different game genres are quite good at having Absolutely. public and others are less good. I mean, did you try doing public with more casual stuff? Yeah, so uh, we have two community managers uh, and <laughs> they, whether or not you, you're asking for it, they tell you. Yeah, true, so I true. mean, th there is that uh, we have. I think 400, almost 500,000 uh, uh, people in our Facebook groups, and they are always, always telling you what they want. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not necessarily a map with, uh, they're not game designers, let's put it that no. way. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, in some ways, I find that a, an inspiration, but uh, I think you're right. I, what I found it interesting, some of the more hardcore games often have public facing Trellos, where they literally help allow people to submit and, and mm. rank things. Um, but it's a different kind of way of looking. I, if, in case you hadn't guessed, I'm a big fan of backlogs. Um, so <laughs> any questions uh, that you guys have got? Otherwise, I'm going to carry on just chatting because I like this stuff. Uh, here's a question in the back there. We've got a microphone coming to you. So do you size the... So, so when you do your prioritization, is that size based on returns? Or is that just, hey, like there's a drop-off here? Or we're missing... Uh, we're missing something here. We're ju we just need a feature to plug it in. Like, how, how do you how do you do the prioritization? How, how do you quantify it if it's quantifiable, or is it just a you okay? Know, so you're you're talking about how do I quantify and prioritize the features that I would want to get into the game and identify like uh, to basically uh, fill these needs. That's yeah. the question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So within the backlog, we have. Uh, and we have about six criteria for the benefits and a team by team breakdown of the costs. And so we have a, a little, little drop down that we kind of choose with the, the KPI impact that we would expect out of this. Of course, whenever you're forecasting, it just gets really hand wavy. So it's not an exact science, but this is something that we do uh, uh, measure or at least try and forecast the cost benefit of every feature that goes into a backlog. Yeah, you'd be amazed when I was at Sony on PlayStation Home, we didn't do any of that. And it, it was terrifying as somebody who came from Telco to not cost benefit yeah. features. It's like horrifying. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, anyway. Any more questions? I have plenty, by the way. Um, let's get on there. All right, so the question for you about um, the timers you had on your challenge feature. Mm -hmm. um, so was that also a variable based on the compulsion loop length or was that static across um, all the goals or challenges? Well, initially, so when you say static, are you talking about like personalization? Like if I spend more time in the game, I would have longer timers or are you just saying, uh, did we correlate those with this, the, the session uh, day uh, kind of within the entire user base? More the first one. OK. Um, we don't do that yet because, again, our community is extremely vocal. And any time we even run A-B tests, there's a large portion of our user base that knows we're running A-B tests and kind of skews the results. And the data scientists are usually mad about that. So I mean, they would, it would be a very bad user experience if both you and I complete the same uh, task, and you have to wait four hours, and I have to wait eight. Right. I'd be really pissed off. So we don't want to have the, the poor user experience. What about like compulsion loop length? So you have like a two to three day goal versus a session goal. Yeah. Um, are those recharge timers different? Yes. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, I'm interested by that kind of last comment. So it sounds like you've got a, quite a challenge to do hypothesis-based testing. How do you get around that? Data scientists. <laughs> <laughs> you say one last question. Yep. Um, so obviously your, your demographic is primarily older female. Um, do you find that that demographic behaves a lot differently than other types of demographics, and how do you adjust your, uh, your compulsion loops to account for that? Interestingly enough, they don't identify themselves as gamers, and for many of them, this is probably their first mobile game. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why we're on Amazon, right? They, love, they have Kindles. <laughs> um, but from my experience, uh, they're very similar. I mean, they, they fall into a lot of the, the similar traits and behaviors as any other game like CSR or Plants vs. Zombies do. I mean, it's just, it's games. <laughs> cool. On that note, I'll say thank you very much.